We're going to begin tonight with a scathing new report from Ontario's Auditor General. She has found multiple issues with the Ford government's development deals involving protected land. Bonnie Lissick took a closer look at Ontario's Green Belt and the province's decision to carve out 7,400 acres of it to build 50,000 homes. It was part of a bigger goal to build 1.5 million. That land is supposed to be off limits to development. In her 93-page report, Lissick says how the land sites were selected was not transparent, fair, objective, or fully informed. She found the Ford government favored certain developers closely connected to the office of Housing Minister Steve Clark. And she writes, there was sufficient land for the target of 1.5 million homes to be built without the need to build on the Greenbelt. Premier Doug Ford says he takes full responsibility for mistakes that were made. The process should have been better, and I'm admitting the process should have been better. But when you're in a housing crisis, when you have an inferno happening, you know, uh, the firefighters run to the, uh, the fire. They don't run away from it. In my position, I have to deal with the crisis. Ontario's Auditor General Bonnie Lissick joins me now. Auditor General Lissick, welcome to Power in Politics. Thank you for having me. You were listening, I know, to the Premier's news conference this afternoon to respond to your report, and I'm wondering overall what your reaction was to what he said. I, I thought it was fair. I thought uh, both the Minister and the, um, uh, the Premier uh, agreed and followed through with the agreement on the 14 recommendations we have in the report. We did receive full cooperation from the Chief of Staff to the Premier, as well as, to, as from the Secretary of the Cabinet. And uh, their responses are incorporated in our report. And the responses from the, the Premier and the Minister are consistent with that. Um, the, one, the one area that we'd hope to have a response that might be a little bit different is the one regarding the um, revisiting of the decision to remove the lands uh, from the Greenbelt, those particular properties. Yes. Uh, you know, again, the policy is open the Greenbelt. The actual action is how do you pick out which pieces of property that you choose to remove from the green belt? And based on the work that we did, we saw that the decision making around the removal of specific um, land sites was um, not fair, was uh, didn't take into account good land planning, didn't take into account environmental considerations, agricultural sit situations, was dismissive of land planning, like I mentioned. I think we thought that that decision uh, could be revisited given and the, the new information. That, and the fact that that is the one recommendation that they have not committed to, in fact, following through on, does that not avoid getting to the core issue of whether or not these lands should have been removed in the first place? Um, both, both the Premier and the Minister told me that they did not know how the lands were selected for the removal. And so the recommendation was in the report because um, if you don't know how those lands were chosen, and now you know that the process that was used was inappropriate and um, gave preferential treatment to those who had access to the chief of staff, to the minister of housing, one would have expected the decision to be revisited. When you say the premier said he, he did not know the way the process was being conducted, from your investigation, from your interviews, do you accept that? To what degree was Premier Ford aware of what was going on? I spoke with both the Premier and the Minister and asked them very directly whether they were aware of the process, whether they were um, involved in the selection of the lands, and in both cases, each one said no. Um, I have no reason to think otherwise, other than, um, you know, when a decision is, is made with certain information that at the end of the day is incorrect um, or perhaps inappropriate, one would expect that decision to be revisited. I mean, he did return again repeatedly to that issue, as you outlined, that he had to, that it was the imperative to remove this land from the Green Belt, to build those 50,000 homes, to answer the acute housing crisis in the province. But that is exactly contradictory to what you found and laid out in your report, is it not? That is correct. We. Um you know, the housing task force, there's an affordability, housing affordability task force that provided the recommendation to the government that the 1.5 million homes was needed. In their report, at the same time, they articulated that lands from the Greenbelt 
weren't needed to achieve the 1.5 million target. We as well, in the last few months, talked to the chief planners in Durham, in York, and in Hamilton, and they reinforced that, that there is enough land available outside of the green belt to provide the housing uh, target of 1.5. So the number, the land availability is not the issue. The speed at which it can be built perhaps is the issue. Um, the other part of it is that the, um, the Municipal Association, EMO of Ontario, also indicated that there was sufficient land available. And um, in fact, when we were doing our work, we found that the Ministry of Housing had allocated the 1.5 million out already to municipalities and given them the targets uh, prior, a week prior before these lands were um, recommended for removal from the Greenbelt. So the fact that the Premier continues to use that housing crisis justification to explain this decision to remove these lands from the Greenbelt, uh, again, contrary to your findings, continues to justify it in that way as recently as this afternoon. Do you accept that? Uh, you know, in our report, we explain why we, we do believe there is enough land without the land having been needed to be removed from the Greenbelt. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is, that is the, the information that I stand behind. Should there be consequences as a result of your findings? We did, um, we have a recommendation in there that there be um, a look by the integrity commissioner of whether or not preferential treatment was given to these developers by the chief of staff. Um, that would be contrary to the under Ontario Public Service Act. I do believe that there's others that might be looking at our report, um, determining whether or not there is anything that they need to do further um, with respect to their role and responsibilities. Well, indeed, there are calls for the OPP to investigate, in addition to the Integrity Commissioner looking at this further. Uh, you mentioned a little bit there, but what are the specific issues that you think warrant further examination? I, I think um, in, our, in our report, we do have recommend, a recommendation there to um, look at improving the um, oversight by the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. We did find during our work that there is a lot of interface between lobbyists and political staff. I mean, it's fine. Uh, lobbyists have a, a role, and a, you know, and they're working for um, you know different organizations and, and trying to get those views heard by the political staff. But we do think that um, that you know when there are operational decisions that need to be made, perhaps that activity is taking away from the role and responsibility of the public service in Ontario. And so that is um, that is a, an issue that we think is very important and should be further reviewed. One, uh, this is um, one of your final reports in that you're coming to the end of your term next month. And I'm wondering, Auditor General Lissick, uh, where this report, this issue ranks in terms of those you've considered over the past decade. There's been a, a lot of interesting files that uh, you know I've, I've uh, had the privilege of working on with uh, my team in the office. Um, you know, I started with the Oakville gas plant, and, and that was an interesting one when I came in. Um, did work on the Pear Hydro plan. We've had COVID reports that I think have had good um, good recommendations, and so this one I would say is unique in the sense that um, we had to I had to work clearing this report with both the political side and the public service side. Typically, our reports and our work done are done looking at the processes that the public service puts in play when they're implementing policy. In this case, um, the implementation of some of the policy was done by political staff. And so um, that was the uniqueness of this file. From an impact perspective, I'm hopeful that the recommendations that we've made in this report will resonate and perhaps um, also resonate with perhaps other ministries that may be making decisions and implementing policy, um, and, and they'll think maybe about the relationship between the political staff and the non-political staff, and and take that in a way that there is um, more reliance on the expertise that does reside in the public service. Based on what you've looked at, can Ontarians trust this government? You know, I think uh, it's like anything, uh, the government uh, has to do what the government wants to do and thinks it needs to do. And at the end of the day, the public makes a decision when they vote. And uh, 
so it's not for me to to predetermine or, or comment on that. But um, you know, I think I think uh, that's part of our our process, right? 